screen now, shall I, Caroline? OK, yep, yeah, I've got, hopefully the camera is now running. Yep, yeah, we're recording, so we are ready when you are. OK, in theory, I've just shared my screen. It should come through in a minute. Yep, yeah, we can see your PowerPoint now. Excellent. Well, stage one is underway then. Good. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Caroline said, I am David Hooton and I'm standing in for Jamie Cordry, who some of you will probably know. One of two of you, I guess, may also know of me or have heard of me in, in and around our previous life, which was obviously with the Deer Initiative. And we're now here with the Forestry Commission to provide advice and support to the sector. So landowners, managers, NGOs, and working within Forest Services team to support wooden creation and management going forward. So this morning's focus is having a look at some of the deer management issues and challenges we have in the area. Uh, it's the back end of the tree health week and you may sort of think well why have why are we linking deer and tree health together and the really good reason for that is that everything we do in our woodlands whether it's wooden creation and new plantings whether it's restoration of ancient semi-natural woodlands, protection of triple SIs, uh, or carbon woodlands, or even trees outside woodlands, we need to be focusing on deer threat and the mitigation we can put in place to help protect our landscapes from deer in the future. That hasn't moved on. My screen has frozen and that's not moving on. Has it moved on for anyone else, Caroline? Um, no, not yet. It might be worth turning off your video feed. Oh gosh, where's that gone? OK, so hopefully that's coming through now. We've got some deer distribution maps and I thought I'd just start with looking at how deer populations have increased their range and spread over the last 50 years. And it's been very dramatic right across the country. We have seen increases in both our native, our row and red deer populations, as well as the introduced species at various times through history the fallow deer range, the muntjac and the seeker and the Chinese water deer, all their populations have increased in number and range very dramatically through that last 50 year period. And it's very important to sort of remember that their population ranges are continuing to increase. So even in areas where we haven't got so many deer, perhaps at the moment, we have got deer moving in. And this is a this is your area, the southeast of England. And this is some work we did back in 2015, looking at the deer threat and deer impact presence across 10 kilometer squares and looking at where the high risk areas are. And I think what we're looking at here is a map that has a high predominance of woodland and habitat very suitable for deer presence. And the food availability in this area is good, but the impacts continue to increase even where we have adequate deer management in place or deer management in place. And this evidence is really important to start gathering and maintaining, but also really understanding where the threats may be in the future. We know that a few years ago, 20 years ago, for instance, there were very few deer in Kent. And you can see that the deer population is moving east through into the woodlands of Kent and the threats in some areas are quite significant. In 2017, 2016, 2017, I was doing some work with the Woodland Trust and the Woodland Trust were partners of, of the Deer Initiative and we were looking at the landscape activity of deer and the threat to the Eastern Clayland woodlands. There's a lot of woodlands in these areas and we looked at the activity levels of fallow, muntjac, roe in these areas and started to sort of map at a 10 kilometre square issue. But we, we surveyed 420 different woodlands, 
looking at the data and looking at activity levels, which were low to low to high, but also the impact. And the impact is really significant in a lot of our intersecting natural woodlands around the country. This sort of work we're trying to extrapolate on and we're working with the Forest Services team to map all of England over the next period of time to start to identify where the risks are and where the biggest challenges are both now and for the future. In those areas that are red and have high impact levels, we need to understand the species present. We need to understand the habitats. We need to understand the landowner objectives. What are your objectives for these areas and how can we help support that in advice to you and with you to develop landscape management, not just of deer populations, but of all habitat structures, whether it's a farmland, conservation headlands, new, new, new hedgerows, new woodlands, ancient semi-natural woodlands. How do we manage our landscapes for the best of the environment and to bring forward the, the carbon targets to bring forward some of the, the landscape objectives we're all starting to towards, particularly with the new schemes coming forward. Where there are very few deer present, we need to be looking at those areas and identifying where the threats will be and where the risks are coming forward from the expanding populations of deer we've already got, and probably trying to maintain lower numbers in these areas where they're moving into to ensure that the impacts don't get as bad as they are elsewhere. There's a lot of evidence now out there. Uh, a lot of the universities, a lot of the organisations have been spending a lot of time looking at the state of our nature, the state of the wildlife, countryside, habitats, and where the threat is to, to a lot of these native species and migratory species we've got. So looking at work from British Ornithology, for instance, such uh, Dr Rob Fuller has spent a lot of time looking at ancient semi natural woodlands, and looking at how their habitat structure is changing and how that is impacting on bird populations within these woodlands. A lot of these bird populations, like the nightingale, are migratory species. So it's not just the habitat here that's important, it's the habitat across the globe from their migratory grounds in Africa and how they migrate to here. And then when they get here, they need these nesting sites. They need the sites that have a good thick understory that have a structure that protects them from predation, that stops the nest being predated upon and provides good territory areas for breeding populations. Across much of lowland England, we have seen increasing deer populations over the last 50 years start to change quite radically, radically the state of our woodlands. And although a lot of woodlands are classed as an improving condition, the true fact is that deer browsing is changing the way our woodlands look. And many of us will walk around a woodland and have seen this open structure for so many years that we've become very used to it. And it's very interesting how we sort of look at how things have changed and, and also make sure that we change and plan for the future as well, collecting the evidence as we go. So how have we got to where we've got? Well, if we go back to the post Ice Age era with woolly mammoths, we would have only have had roe deer and red deer. They are our two native species of deer. And that is what the habitats and structures would have grown up with. Their populations roamed freely. They were top predators. Their populations roamed quite happily with predation. Then we had the Normans move in and they brought the fallow deer with them. The fallow deer, predominantly kept within enclosed areas for food and later on for hunting. But then by the late Middle Ages and the early late 1700s, the deer populations were nearly non-existent. They'd been wiped out of the countryside and that was due to our use of the countryside and the need to produce food for the local people and the way we use our landscapes. Then we move on to the 1800s. And we have the parkland enclosures again, and deer were being reintroduced into our landscapes, predominantly in parks, but also towards the end of the 1800s, we started to see the introduction of new species of deer to the UK, not just the historic red and roe populations and the historic fallow populations within the parklands, but the introduction of muntjac, Chinese water deer, and seeker. 
So now we have six species of deer living within the UK. And these populations slowly spread out. They were released from some of the parklands following the Second World War. And then by the 1950s, the Forest Commission started to employ wildlife rangers, people who were there to manage the wildlife, to look at the populations and to control and reduce impacts to, in this case, the forest crop. In 1963, we had the introduction of the Deer Act, the very first stab at trying to protect the welfare of deer in our UK landscape, making sure that they weren't being snared or shot with shotguns and making sure that their management was humane. And from that period onwards, we've seen various changes, but we've also seen the rapid spread of deer across our landscape areas. We've got five species of deer in many of our areas now within the east of England. In the south of England, we've got the fallow, we've got the roe, we've got muntjac, we've got seeker deer down in Dorset moving through. And these populations are always on the move. So wherever we are, we have deer within a few hundred yards of us probably. In every woodland, we will have at least one species and probably two or three species locally. And that causes a huge effect on our woodland areas. So where are we now? What do we do next? Well, we've got here through a whole range of means and deer have increased their range and density because of the way we manage our countryside and because of the way we have managed the deer themselves. So often we look at the population densities of areas and the, the cull data and see that many, many more male deer are being culled than female. If we're not actually culling the female, the ones that we produce every year, the populations will increase. It's called natural recruitment, and we need to be looking at how we establish adequate control to meet landowner and land management objectives across areas. Very localised management can have a localised effect with Rowan Muntjac, and some work we've been doing with uh, some professors, uh, Rory Putman in particular, and an Italian student called Nico. We've looked at how we manage deer across landscape areas, and it's very clear from that research that we can manage Muntjac and Row at fairly localised areas. The more of a buffer you have around your woodland area, the more chance you have of maintaining lower impact levels and activity levels. But with the herding species, the fallow, the red deer, we need to be managing those at much, much greater density uh, landscape areas. We've all talked about culling and controlling at the herd range, which with fallow deer can be reasonably significant. It can amount to a number of tens of thousands of acres of area. The research uh, Professor Dolan and others has started to indicate that we need to be looking at ranges of at least 30 miles radius, which is very significant. And that will often take in a number of different herds and of groups of deer, herds of fallow deer in particular, some work we did with red, with red deer up in Norfolk over the last 10 years has shown that they will move at least 20 miles from the site of their tagging at different times of the year. So that's why it's so important to think about the landscape management going forward. We have a number of drivers really for deer management going forward. We've got the 25 year environment plan, thinking about carbon, water, air, flooding, and how deer will move, move across these landscapes, changing the structure and uh, effect and usefulness of these planting schemes. So we've got England Tree Planting Programme, Nature Recovery Networks, Environmental Land Management Scheme coming forward, and this massive desire to create a more diverse, resilient landscape that we can all live and work. And really, we must remember that, that deer are an absolute landscape feature. They're not just woodlands they are this much wider landscape as well. And going forward, we've got to make sure that the, the deer management, the deer evidence is collected across these landscape areas. And we don't just think of deer as a woodland feature. Linking the deer to, to tree disease, we've obviously got ash, ash dieback, cholera, infecting many of our woodlands across this area. And I think it's really important that where we're managing woodlands for tree disease, 
whichever disease that may be now or in the future and there's obviously a lot of true disease out there that isn't very far from the UK borders we've got to be thinking about how we're restructuring and what impact the deer will have on that restructuring effect and and success and we've got to make sure that we understand what we're looking for so do we actually remember what a unbrowsed woodland will look like this was taken in the south of England, Jamie took it a few years ago, and we're looking at here a woodland with a structure. We're looking at a woodland with an understory, with a number of different species present. Do we get that in our, all our woodlands? I appreciate that some browsing levels and opening up may be beneficial to a number of species, but where we're seeing deer browsing numbers increasing, we do see woodland structure opening up very dramatically. One of the things we always sort of try and emphasise is the amount of, and I apologise, but it's just before lunch, that the deer consume a vast quantity of food. Fallow deer will be eating round about five kilograms of food a day. This is day in, day out. So what we're looking at is if you've got 100 fallow deer living in and around your woodland area, they are eating in the region of 182 tonnes of food from that landscape each and every year. I think it's really important to realise that this has got to be food that is surplus to our land management requirements and objectives. So if we're trying to grow our trees, if we're trying to develop structures of hedgerows and buffer strips around arable crops, this is food that's coming from that resource. So this is a woodland again in the south of England where fallow deer were allowed into an enclosed area. It was an area that had been rejuvenated, the fence line was taken down and these fallow deer moved through and very quickly they took away that understory structure. They opened the area up and as woodland area increases, uh, openness increases, we start to see a more grassy, sedgy understory take place. After about six years, these woodland areas we're looking at, this, the whole understory has been removed. This is a slightly different woodland, but the same effect. But it, it just shows that the structural difference and availability for biodiversity, environmental features is dramatically reduced if you have this all open wood pasture network in what should be a, a woodland that's suitable for a lot of birds and bees and butterflies and flora. Very significant changes that We've almost grown to accept in many areas because it's what we see day in, day out across many of our woodland areas. This happens to be South Suffolk, but again, it's representative of a number of areas within lowland England. You get groups of fallow deer bunching together. It's a buck, not a stag. Sorry, I apologise for the, the landowner on that behalf. This is an area that was historically undermanaged. There was a landowner who didn't really want to control the deer, so he allowed the deer populations to build up on his land holding. What happened was they spent a lot of the daylight hours there, causing impact to his arable crops, which he was relatively content with. But then the deer would move from these areas onto the surrounding woodland triplets eyes. And there's 10 different woodland triplets eyes in this area, and they're all being impacted very heavily by this fallow deer population and this is why we need to be really concentrating on understanding the landscape movement of deer, the landscape impacts, i.e. collect the evidence and also be very conscious of how our actions affect other people within that herd range. So we've set up exclosure plots, a very simple straightforward method of monitoring woodland and how woodlands change in respect to night levels and browsing pressures. And when we're talking about browsing pressures, we must also not forget about hares and rabbits. And then of course, once a crop gets to a certain age, we mustn't forget about our gray squirrels. But this really demonstrates the ability for woodlands to regenerate and also develop structure. Heavy browsing on the outside, and you get a bit of protection, and very quickly within a few years, you start to see bramble, bluebells in this case, and sedges starting to re-emerge. 
In the wider landscape, we also get quite significant crop damage. This is a, a field of sugar beet. It's impacted very heavily by a large population of red deer. And winter wheat, winter barley also gets very heavily affected where we've got these high populations moving in from these non-management areas. Some research on the east of England cost to arable crops back in 2005 indicated there was about five million pounds worth of crop damage each and every year across the six counties of East Anglia. If we start to replicate that across the country using current impact data, that will be significantly more. So this is where we are at the moment. We're a, a team of three deer officers covering the, the South East, the East and East Midlands and the North West and West Midlands. Uh, Jamie is your, your current man. I'm David from the East of England and Alistair Boston in the North West. We then have a National Deer Advisor, David Jam, and he works at national level looking at policy going forward, working very closely with senior management and, and DEFRA teams on how we form and guide deer management for the future through the schemes and the incentives. A lot of our focus is obviously on resilient woodlands, developing new woodland areas, working with landowners to support their deer mitigation impacts, woods into new management, trees and hedges, that general landscape of where deer move, how they can cause threats. We look at deer impacts, but also when we talk about rewilding, the wilding projects of southern England are really significant and they have some massive benefits. And deer will fit into the grazing regimes and browsing regimes in some of these. But we need to understand at what point their interactions are going to be most beneficial. Is it right at the start of a project or is it slightly further down the line? What browsing densities are acceptable? What are our objectives? Do we want regeneration everywhere? Do we need open space? Open space is going to be good for your butterflies. It's going to be good for some of the insects. So we need to be very clear about where our priority species may be and how deer will interact and affect those. And this is all work that the teams are able to offer support with. And then we're looking at adaptive management. How do we manage our landscapes and those things happening within it? So top right, we've got our landscape objectives and the scale at which these objectives and habitats are being created is going to be really important. In the east of England, we've only got six or seven percent woodland cover. In the south of England, it's much, much higher. And where you have large tracts of woodland, you can probably have a few more deer than we can in our small woodland areas here. What's the effect of fencing compartments to protect those areas of moving deer into and high, increasing the pressure on adjacent areas and blocks? Do we really want to be fencing woodlands into the future? That affects the movement of other animals. Do we want to be species specific in what we, how we strategize our culls? Do we understand the survival rates and growth of the populations? What are the environmental variables on that survival of young animals, for instance, in Scotland and North of England, reproduction rates may be lower, survival rates may be lower. In lowland England, I think we can say that fallow deer will have their young each and every year from year two to year 12 when they are 13 when they die, naturally, if they're not culled. So population recruitments vary across the country. Do we fully understand that? And are we targeting the right species, the right sexes through our population management? Do we actually look at what we're doing? Do we assess the effectiveness and the results of our land management objectives, but also our deer management and our population estimates? This is a, an area up in Rockingham Forest in Northamptonshire, South Lincolnshire. This is not a deer park. This is a wild population of fallow deer. But looking through the Landscape objectives. This is a landowner who will not or hasn't in the past culled his deer. The neighbouring states have culled their deer. Very high impact arable crops and the deer have moved onto this area. In this group, there were 832 individuals when I took this drone footage. Two years later, we did a similar count and there was 1,200. Now, these are some significant populations and we started to get the build up of these in a number of parts of the country. 
And we need to be working very effectively with landowners in all areas to try and understand and develop a wider understanding of the impacts of these sort of populations. But what we're really interested in is the impact the deer have on the environment. And I tend to go back to what available food is there for these animals through the hardest time of year. So in the spring and summer, we have very good understory growth. We have lots of plants growing, lots of regeneration, lots of crops for the deer to browse through that spring summer period. As winter progresses, the available food sources reduce and we need to get these animals through the winter without any welfare issues. Body conditions will always decline through the winter quite often if they haven't got winter cereal crops to feed on. So this is why we need to be thinking about the structure of our woodlands and how we're looking at them. Slightly more understory in this, in this woodland and we've got bramble. The bramble, there are many, many different subspecies of bramble, some of which are very highly palatable and other species which are less palatable. So we need to understand the palatability of, of bramble. And bramble, remember, is an evergreen plant. So through the winter, it should be holding its leaves. In the spring growth, you'll see the old dark leaf, the dark green leaf, as well as the lighter green leaf. Quite often in areas where we have high deer browsing pressure, in the, you'll see the, the bramble leaves being stripped through the winter as a good food source. And in the spring, only the, the fresh green growth. That is not natural. We need the, to see the bramble with the dark leaves and the light leaves in the spring, so it's an evergreen plant. In areas of coppicing, we need to be very aware of the potential deer threat and deer impact. This is an area in south, the south of England, again, another one of Jamie's patches. And it was a coppice area where they thought they'd probably be all right. They thought they'd probably get the growth to grow, the regrowth on the coppice stores to grow. But they thought that they would put a bit of an enclosure in the middle just to see what would happen. Well, without the deer browsing, you would have got a thicket area developing very rapidly. The rest of the coppice area died off. And that's why they've installed that second fence to try and allow that area to regenerate. The problem is, of course, is if you lost a number of years of growth, and you will also potentially have lost the viability of those stalls, the historic, the ancient part of the woodland being destroyed because of deer browsing. We don't need to be demonstrating these sites anymore. Basically, what we know is that deer browse crops. We know that we can monitor very effectively the deer activity and impact in areas. And under the monitoring schemes, if we have anything more than a, a low moderate, we need to be thinking about about how we protect our woodlands and our woodland structure going forward. And then we need to be thinking about preferential browsing. There are a number of species that deer don't like to eat. There are some species that are highly palatable. And then there's a raft of them in the middle where we start to browse on them if they run out of other. And like any animal, deer will browse on what they prefer first and then as that is eaten out they'll move on to the less palatable plants in the landscape and this is it's quite important to sort of understand this happens to be in the peak and most of the surrounding vegetation was being browsed but the main tree crop wasn't because there's non palatable species if we went further north these trees would have been eaten by the deer because there was less food available so the density of deer within this particular picture was at at a moderate to high level, and they hadn't quite got round to eating the tree crop. This is East Anglia, and again, I'm thinking about sort of wider landscapes now and how deer affect some of the things we might be trying to do outside woodland areas. We need to be planting more hedgerows. We need to be re-establishing the hedgerows that are already there, and we need to be planting more trees in those hedgerow areas particularly in the, some of the prairie-like landscapes we have over, over in our neck of the woods. But deer really severely affect what a hedgerow looks like. This is a, caused by fallow deer population just in the middle of Suffolk. Excuse me. And then we need to be thinking about sort of the countryside stewardship schemes, the buffer lands, the, the, hedge, the, the headlands, the pollen mixes. How will deer affect those? How does the browsing affect? change between the species. So muntjac are very selective feeders. 
row again very selective about what they want to eat the delicate soft vegetation within our landscapes fallow deer and red deer are much heavier grazers and browsers and they will also cause quite a lot of trampling effect in some of these areas then we've got wild venison wild venison is a product of the deer management that is undertaken to protect our land management objectives it's a high quality product it's natural it's healthy high in protein good source of iron low in fats you know it's a very good high quality natural meat and it certainly has a place in our diet what has happened over the last 24 months though is that there's been a changing marketplace carcass prices were very good to the game dealer back in 2018 we were getting about £2.50 a kilo over the period up until October November 2019 we started to see quite a significant decline in usage in some hospitality areas and then of course we've had Covid and that really has shut down all of hospitality and really changed the landscape in terms of where the game dealers and stalkers can sell their venison product. We can also sell venison locally if we're if we're stalking. We are, operate under something called the hunter's exemption. So those people who are culling can sell the product locally, providing they are registered with the local authority as a food. And this is cru crucial going forward that we maintain a really robust supply chain from the field right through to the consumer whichever route it takes. And the product takes many routes. It, it, go, it goes from the stalker through to a chiller, through to a game dealer, through to wholesalers, onto maybe the supermarkets. Or it's following routes from the field to a butcher shop locally. And there are regulations regarding that as well. Everyone has to be registered and everyone needs to be doing it properly. And one of the things I would urge the whole sector to be doing is maintaining very high standards of control, management, and handling of this food product. And really, we have to remember that the deer we're managing are food. And it's not a sporting, well, it may be a sporting asset, but even where it's a sporting asset, it is still food. And we have to be treating it as such to maintain consumer. Comp so last summer, I facilitated the establishment of what we call the the British Wild Venison Working Group. It's a group of game dealers, processors, suppliers, all working together to understand and develop and support the development of wider standards with the venison sector and to give people like the large supermarkets the confidence that the product we're providing to them is of the highest standards and the highest standards are being met throughout the chain. We have seen a good increase over the last 10 months of internet sales of venison. Hospitality obviously has been closed, so that market has been very much shut down. But there are some really nice local sales occurring through registered premises. Uh, again, for instance, are selling into Aldi, Tesco's, Waitrose up in northern border, and they're working on developing continuity of supply through to Lidl and also to Aldi at the moment. So we've got some really good campaigns going on at the moment. Taste of Game are producing some fantastic recipe leaflets, as are a number of the processors. And just trying to raise the awareness that the British Wild Venison is a good quality product. We're also working with Grown in Britain, who are developing a quality assurance scheme for wild British Wild Venison. So there is an standard that we can go to the consumers and the supermarkets and say this is how we're operating and it's of a very clear guidance of how you how you work. So the key priorities going forward really are making sure that we establish very clear landscape objectives. We understand what it is we're trying to achieve across our areas. And these might be quite localised or they might be of much wider landscape areas so across the South Downs, for instance, or the Build Valley or wherever it might be with much wider objectives. We understand and monitor the threats that deer may have to these objectives, both and also into the future. If we're establishing new woodland in an area, 
the threat currently would be the deer will eat our new trees. In 15 or 20 years time, the threats might be slightly different. The threat might be that they'll change how the understory looks within our woodlands. But these new woodland areas may well become holding areas for deer that may then impact elsewhere in our landscape on other features. So we need to be thinking about how we engage with our landowners and they manage across areas. We work to these priorities and we work to try and come to a consensus of where we need to be in the population management. And ultimately, we need to be increasing effective management and the efficiency of the culling taking place. It takes a considerable amount of time to properly manage deer populations, to undertake the monitoring that needs to take place to ensure that we are consistent with our approach, but also can justify our actions. And really, we must remember that deer of all species are here to stay. We must learn to live with them. We must learn really that there will be a continual spread in range and probably there'll be an increase in numbers in some areas if we continue doing what we do. And I think that over the last 25 years of significant involvement on my half over in the east of England, we've seen populations increasing of all species and that's with our current management practices in place. So we need to go back to our need to look at what we do, that circle of monitor impacts and objectives and really start to think about what we're, what we're trying to achieve and if it's actually achievable. And just as a reminder, there's no eradication policy for deer, although I, I talk a lot about management, there is no eradication policy. It is a management tool to maintain some deer in the landscape, sustainable wildlife management, if you like, to ensure that there's a balance between the habitats and objectives that we're working with and the animals and deer that live within them. So this is uh, this is Sassofi again. Thank you for listening. I think we'll have a good session of questions now. Uh, Caroline, did you want to take control again? So thank you very um, much. Yep, yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that, David. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat. There's been a bit of discussion about rewilding and following the Franz Vera sort of model. So if we'll just jump into that. So it's a, a comment and a question from Anthony about grazing introduced to woodland to attempt to restore to wood pasture is very popular in some circles following Franz Vera as contributing to biodiversity. And this is part of the controversy of Vera's rewilding was his willingness to allow natural boom and bust population changes, which includes deaths from starvation. It may be unacceptable in domestic farmed animal, but are wild deer in the same category? Do we manage or worry about deaths of voles and rabbits from lack of food? Uh, I know that was a bit of a long one. <laughs> <laughs> so if I, uh, it is. I, 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 I did touch on wilding projects and I think that the way that the wilding projects develop will really guide the browsing levels within them. We have to remember that quite often the scale at which we are operating isn't large enough. We're only looking at quite small patchwork areas within a landscape and I think that going forward we need to be much more clear about how large we work an area we work at so if you're only working at a few hundred acres you can't have very many browsing animals but if you work at seven or eight thousand acres or hectares across a whole landscape area that takes in different habitats there may be more opportunity to have higher numbers but I think that the welfare issue of deer is or, or wildlife generally is has to be paramount and we mustn't really compromise the welfare of the animals living within living within our landscapes okay thank you i think it's interesting when you're comparing it against the sort of the death of voles and rabbits from lack of food and obviously they're they're much smaller mammals that can last much less time without food and also they do have natural predators in our environment whereas the deer they there's only us there's only people Nothing, nothing else is taking out deer at any sort of size or scale. Um, so where else? I think Charlotte had a question, which I think you've partially covered or mostly covered. What opportunities for culled deer to be used in mainstream food chains such as supermarkets? So you did cover that, but I don't know if you've got any further comments you want to make on that, David. Uh, yes, certainly. And uh, venison is a very interesting subject, really. I mean, there's a lot of venison 
different sources of venison, if you like, from both UK produced and from Europe and also New Zealand. We're working very closely, obviously, on the wild British venison side of things at the moment, and the supermarkets are are certainly increasingly starting to use wild venison. There, there's a few blockages at the moment, which obviously there's a working group we are trying to sort of rectify. Um, but the interest is definitely there. Brilliant. I've um, got a question from Mike. Um, so could livestock farmers add certain species to their herd, i.e. alpacas are known to help to do her foxes? I can't quite remember which part that came in on. I don't know, Mike, if, if you're here and able to unmute if you wanted to develop on that question. Can you hear me OK there, Caroline? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm from the Mersey Forest. I'm a, a hydrologist by background, mainly working on natural flood management projects in the Pennines. So um, there is issues with deer uh, up on the uplands, really. So I guess it's uh, you hear varying stories from landowners about putting things like flags out in, in, in planting mixes and things like that. So so obviously there's deer fencing and less palatable tree trees that we could go for. But um, from farming friends, I know they do keep the odd alpaca because it's quite useful to keep foxes out of their uh, farmyard areas. I just wondered if there's any insight to or benefit to including, say, an alpaca with a flock of sheep or, or, or otherwise, or if there's any knowledge on that indeed. So I suppose it's one perhaps more over to David. <laughs> so that, that's not a question I've been asked before. I've got that. So that's an interesting one. Um, I'm not sure if there are any sort of livestock elements that can naturally keep deer out of out of areas. There are, Mike. I mean, it's, it's it's actually a really interesting question actually because it's something that historically we've always said that sheep and deer won't mix, and that if you've got sheep on your fields, the deer will probably stay off them. Uh, and at certain times, the the spraying of fields will also deter deer. So it's, it's sort of the man management aspect, as well as some of the wild, uh, the stock, perhaps. Where deer are at slightly higher densities, or where they're under greater pressure, they will mix with other farm livestock. I've never come across whether alpacas and deer will mix or not, but I, th I think also we need to look at the species of deer present. So maybe some the larger species wouldn't want to be mixing with some of the other stock. Uh, but look at the landscapes, look at how they work together and if they need food, they will mix. OK, thanks, David. That's uh, useful to know. And, and, and I guess the other one, you're talking about the flags as well and sort of other deterrents. A lot of these other deterrents that people will talk about, we've, we've talked about lion dung in the past and how you can do different scents on different areas. And if you leave your hair cuttings out in the field, they won't come near that, that for a while. Deer will habituate to a lot of different techniques we use. So I did meet a landowner who was using Rodeo 4 quite regularly to deter deer from coming onto his, his crops. It was that sort of general continual Works talk that deterred the deer from staying <laughs> too long. But again, they got very used to it because they suddenly realised that it was just a radio and it was talk and actually there was no threat to themselves. Deer are a prey species and prey species de are deterred by their fellows dying and being culled or predators in a, in a landscape. So you've got top predators, they will also move deer populations around. Yeah. Uh, top predators within lowland England probably aren't going to be very feasible, but um, maybe in some of the wilder glens of North, North Scotland, perhaps you could have wild predators, but lowland England isn't really home for wild predators as such. Yeah, no, it's really useful. I'm uh, working on the Woodland Trust Smithills estate, the largest uh, English estate, and, and roe deer are an issue there, and then also above above Littleborough and Rochdale. So, so more widely, these are quite lunar landscapes, sort of less than one percent woodland cover in the catchment, and you know, set against the thirteen as a national average, which isn't necessarily great in in, in European league tables. So, uh, so any bits of advice I can get are uh, yeah, re really helpful and. Um, I guess forest research provides some good good information and I've come across that before so it's probably just worth me having a quick refresh of that. I think at one particular site they're feeding the deer apples the previous landowner from their trees so I think that's uh, partly to blame <laughs> for their for domestication in that location. It, it is and, and they 
deer will find food sources they like and they'll continue to come back to them uh, supplementary feeding in some woodlands has sort of actually increased impact levels so they sort of thought that we'll feed our deer and look after them and provide alternative food sources actually backfired so that where the deer were moving from laying up areas to the feeding area they were also bark stripping and browsing en route to their supplementary food source so that was that did backfire quite badly at one point um, but Mike, I mean, if you want to give us a ring at some stage and have a chat more more broadly, please feel free to do it. Caroline, I suspect we can put my contact details up, can't we, and Jamie's, just so that people have got that. Yeah, yeah, I can do that for, for all areas. I suspect if you're Mersey Forest, you're probably under Alistair, Alistair's watch up in the northwest. So yes. we can, we can yeah. send you his details as well. Took, took down his name. Yeah, thanks for that, guys. It's appreciated. OK, so next question is from Dave asking, is there any research on deer impact on trees in urban or suburban areas? We've had some serious browsing damage to a few park trees and street trees in the northern outskirts of Reading. Uh, urban deer. Urban deer. Yep, certainly. I mean, there's, deer are certainly moving into a lot of our urban fringe areas and living within a lot of the city areas. So Southampton, for instance, has got road deer populations living within it. Most villages and towns will have muntjac creeping through them and fallow deer populations are fairly well resident, certainly in the top end of London, uh, Epping Forest, Brentwood, that sort of area, as well as I suspect areas of the south into city areas. The control of deer within these areas is obviously going to be much more complicated. Um, and there's obviously the, the how do you manage deer in an urban area is one of the things that we've been toying with for a number of years now and there's Actually, there's a, a press report about Epping Forest today on the, on the media about how they manage deer in the urban forest at, at Epping. So it's one of those areas where impacts will be high. And with all these things, please, please be preemptive in deer management mitigation. So if you're planning woodland creation, if you're pl planning on planting shrubs in areas or urban trees, let's have a look at the deer impact threat first and then plan what we may be planting and how we mitigate against the potential impacts taking place. There's, there's little point in paying quite significant sums of money into tree planting if it's only going to be eaten and browsed away by the deer. So think about the impact mitigation, think about what you've got first and then and let's get on with the planting. And it's not just planting, it's actually continuation of establishment. Uh, establishment of trees and hedgerows should be more the key to, to planting. That's lovely, thank you, David. I will just scroll to see where we are. Uh, I've got a question from George. In an area with a high fallow deer population in heavily wooded part of Sussex, will coppiced hazel stools survive browsing by being covered in brush or is fencing the only solution? Eeks, it depends on how well it's, it's brushed um, and it depends on how significant your fallow population is. I would be going down the route of fencing probably. Um, I think that there's an issue with browsing between the stalls because one of the things about coppicing is we also want to see the establishment potentially of new standards coming through. If you're planting those, that's one thing, but if you're relying on natural regeneration, that won't occur where you've got browsing between the stall areas. With some of these politically woodlands as well, the ground flora can be seriously affected by both the trampling and browsing by the fallow deer as well. So you need to be thinking about not just the coppice stalls, but also that slightly wider biodiversity, a positive biodiversity aspect of actually doing the coppice management. So gut feeling on that one without seeing the site and not knowing much about it, I'd say fence. But again, just think about the quality of the brushing. Brilliant. OK, I think we've got a, a few more coming up. Just bear with me. Um, yeah, George has also made a comment about that venison has an image problem in the UK. For whatever reason, people think of Bambi and King Henry VIII, whereas they can divorce themselves from death of animal um, when it's a cow rather than a deer, um, which is mm -hmm. I, th I think is a, probably a fair point to make. And said so there's also issues with lead from rifle round and concern regarding chemicals ingested by deer who are grazing on sprayed or treated crops. I don't know if you've got anything okay. to follow from that, David. I've got 
two thoughts on it. I think that the the wider population is actually starting to understand that the venison produced from landscape woodland management is actually a good product. We're certainly seeing internet sales increasing through lockdown. There isn't the there's such a sort of a an anti-culling feel now across most of these areas because we're justifying the the management on science. And I think that there's an acceptance though that if deer need to be managed, let's make use of that product. Uh, in terms of lead, we're working very closely with shooting organisations at the moment to look at lead and non-lead ammunition for rifle deer management. There are some really good alternatives out there now. I, I think six, seven years ago that there weren't, but the bullet manufacturers are developing rounds now that are very good. There's no welfare issue with the control and there's no real safety issue with using the copper ammunition now at all. So we are encouraging people to phase across the supermarkets and the, the consumers want to see lead phased out, but in a sensible timeline. So ammunition's out there, have a trial with it. It's good. I use it. The Forest Commission, Forestry England have been using it now for five, six years. Uh, a number of the other organisations have moved and are also moving across to non-lead alternatives. So the options there. Uh, and I think we should be at least trialling it and using it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, question from Nicola saying, what about the reintroduction of wolves? What would your thoughts be on that? <laughs> I, think, I, I, I would love to see top predators back in the UK, but I think if we look at the landscape and look at how effective they would be in controlling deer populations, I don't think they would control populations at all. There's too many deer out there and the numbers that these animals eat would not be enough each year to maintain a population. With Lowland England, I was, I, I was involved a little bit with discussions with the Lynx Trust. Plus, Oh, we've just lost you there, David, or it could be me. No, he's gone. It will well. be, but certainly. Have I gone? Sorry, you're back now. Um, I'm not quite sure the point uh, at which we lost you. Um, no. yeah. uh, Lowland England, wolves, no. <laughs> yes, yes, that was it. It was Lowland England wolves. That was it. <laughs> I think that, that uh, we have to look at the landscape we're living in and how effective any top predator is at actually controlling numbers. We've got a lot of deer on the on the ground at the moment. We need to be managing at least 30 percent of the population every year just to stand still. And top predators wouldn't have a very significant impact on deer populations. So have we lost? I think we might have, are you there, Caroline? Yeah, definitely here. Yeah. Um, so more, more questions. We've got a lot of questions on so which is great. Um, question from Tom saying, fishing groups recently renamed spider crab as Cornish king crab to get people eating it. Should we rename venison to something such as woodland cow? <laughs> no, I think that venison is accepted as a, a good quality product. It's got it's got resonance. It's got a name that people understand. Uh, I can I can understand why the Cornish may well have changed the name of their spider crab. Uh, I don't see a na real need to change the name venison. I think sometimes we need to be marketing venison more cleverly. I think so sometimes we need to be marketing it marketing it to the species that it's come from. So should munchak be classed as munchak or should it be classed as venison roe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera? I think that there is a, a need for that because there is a difference in quality of product depending upon what your taste is. Muntjac is a soft, sweet meat. Fallow deer will be much coarser grained and red deer coarser again and, and different flavours. So we need to be marketing it as British wild. That would be a useful start. And maybe in some areas is selling it and marketing it as the species it's come from. Brilliant. Um, so we've got a, a couple of comments which are 
at odds with each other here. I've got one comment from Christine saying lots of reports from deer managers and landowners that deer have gone nocturnal with increased public presence in the landscape this year. And a conflicting view from John, who says that's the opposite where he is. So have you noticed any sort of trends <laughs> like that one way or another? It's certainly the nocturnal aspect has become a problem, particularly in in some of our high public access woodlands with muntjac, they seem to be moving right on last light and before dawn. So that's partly public pressure. The other reason deer will go nocturnal, if you want to call it that, and change the way they move is because of culling pressure and the pressure the deer are under themselves from us as predators. And I think it's very important to understand how we manage the deer so that they don't get pushed into these nighttime dark movement areas. Uh, I'd be interested to hear from John what sort of numbers he's got, what species he's got as to, and why it's an opposite effect in his area. It's potentially because of the deer have got used to people being around and they're very tolerant of deer and dogs perhaps just walking through them. If you look at populations that are under culled or not culled at all, they do get very used to human presence. You've only got to look at some of the Forestry England sites and see the deer walking in and around the visitor centres or the deer on the urban fringe in London where they get very used to being amongst people playing golf, walking their dogs and aren't being culled. So if they're not being culled and they're not threatened, they will probably be very visible during the day. Where deer are being managed quite heavily, they will change their movements to avoid predation, in this case the culling. Lovely. Um, next question is from Guy. We, I think we've partially answered it, but if there's any more detail, that'd be great. With regards to venison, is there a variation in demand dependent on species? Is one tastier than another? There is a, a difference in demand. Uh, historically, a lot of roe deer would have been exported to Europe. The Europeans have a, a very high regard for roe deer meat, uh, whereas the UK are less distinguishing between the different species, which is why I sort of just said, I think we need to be cleverer about how we market our species and make sure that the qualities of different meats are utilised in the different audience types we're marketing it to. So would you say maybe something would be akin to like a brisket that you need to slow cook and we market it that way. So it's particularly species would be ideal for slow cooking, whereas maybe your muntjac would be great on a barbecue, that, that kind of thing. Uh, yes, and we're, in that respect, Caroline, we're also talking about cut, aren't we? So you need to be utilising the right bits of the carcass for the right meal type and the right size of joint for the number of people you're trying to feed. And I guess the, the right species depend upon what your taste is like and how, you, how, how you're cooking it. I don't marinate any of the venison I cook. So I'm, I'm cut, culling roe, munchak and fallow. And I will use the bits of those to make sure they're utilised properly, but I don't marinate, but I will make curries, um, we make sausages, we make burgers, we slow cook the shoulders, we do the haunches on the barbecue in the summer for family parties, and we're utilising the quality of the specific meals that we're trying. And that's what we're trying to encourage the game dealers and the people who are selling to really focus on, say, and try and work with their customers to help them understand how you can utilise the whole carcass and how it can be a quality product whichever way you cook it from whichever species it is you just have to make sure it's right but it's no more complicated than any other meat species we've got brilliant thank you um, next question is from martin which uh, it might be more of a jamie follow-up question but how soon should we expect deer to become a significant issue in east kent I would suggest, Martin, that that is going to be dependent upon what your neighbours to the west are doing. <laughs> so if you've got really robust deer management on the edge of that range that's moving east, it will take much longer than if it's not very robust. Deer of all species are moving around a lot. Uh, we've seen Chinese water deer up here in the east of England, for instance, moving a couple of kilometres east. Fallow deer in, in Kent may well move slightly quicker because they're obviously much more mobile. Mm. And yeah. it's making sure that when you see the first one, you actually 
them effectively at that first point of, of vision rather than letting them establish first. So if you can control your populations as they're establishing, it will take much longer as well. OK, fantastic. Um, question from Hugh. I manage two urban woodlands heavily walked by dogs and owners where there is no deer browsing. Do deer think dogs are wolves? No, <laughs> they don't. Uh, they will get chased by dogs and if they're continually being chased, chances are they might avoid those areas. And if you've got very, very high public access, maybe you, that's why your areas are safe. I mean, it's, it's interesting the interactions between people and the different species of deer and how their dogs are. I guess if you've got dogs that are very well behaved and not charging all over the place, the deer will become more, more tolerant rather than being chased around the whole time. OK, brilliant. Uh, we've got no more uh, questions in the chat, but I know a few people are not able to use the chat function. So has anyone got a question who would like to raise their hand? If you use the raise hand function and then uh, I'll call on you to unmute. Nothing showing up. I'm going to look in the participants box. Oh, we've got a couple more questions popping up in the chat. Um, so one from Angela, what species of trees are less attractive to deer? Well, generally the, the conifers tend to be less less attractive than the broadleaf and the, the most attractive would be sort of ash. Well, it obviously isn't, isn't very suitable these days. <laughs> Going all the way down to the slightly slower growing ones like the oak and field maple is probably slightly lower down the list than a sycamore deer don't like sycamore uh, polonia we're not quite sure about at the moment uh, so there's, there's a number of species that again it, it would depend upon the the density of deer within the area which is a slight problem so because all trees will be impacted on by deer at the wrong density and you also have to think about the speed at which trees grow and will grow away from the, the potential brows. So the faster growing trees will get away from the deer brows quicker than the slower ones like oak and field maple. So it's it's not just on which are, are less species, which are more palatable or not. Um, it's also the speed at which they grow. OK, I've um, got another question from Hugh. Is there, do large rivers act as deer barriers? Uh, to a degree, but deer are also very good swimmers. So if they want to cross, they will cross. And there's lots of examples of red deer swimming on the Scottish coasts. We've got seeker deer swimming across the Paul Basin. We've got muntjac swimming across various rivers in the east of England because they want to get to the other side. So they are good swimmers and if they want to cross, they will. OK, I've got uh, another question from from Mike. Just bear with me because it just popped up my screen. Um, is there any benefit to adding brush to new woodland? I guess woodland creation projects. Uh, well, uh, again, it's, it's going to depend upon what species of deer you've got present, Mike, the densities of which they are and the, the the land area of woodland creation taking place, I'd have thought, and where you're going to get the brush from. Brush, brushing and brush piling will help reduce movement across areas, but you've also got to remember that brush, unless it's very, very thick, will break down quite quickly, and the deer themselves will push paths through it if they see a food source there. So, so in some respect, yes, in some respect, no. Thanks. Next oversight from uh, timber clearance for a flood basin. So the opportunity is there to use it. So I might just use it. It, it certainly wouldn't do any harm. And the, and the other way of using brash is actually around the compartment. So it's not necessarily just scattering it across your planting area, but use it as a, a brash fence. And if you go back to sort of the medieval parkland scenarios where they use the chestnut paling around compartments to keep deer out, whether you can create something like that and dead hedging at some of the wildlife trust site woods has been very effective over the past uh, few years, particularly where you've got 
well, we've got Muntjac Row and Fallow in some of these areas and they're they're using it, but you, it's quite labour intensive. So if you've got volunteer labour, that's fine. If you're paying for it by the by the hour, it might not be very cost effective. So a scattering around across and around the areas, it can help. Yes, it can. Thanks. OK, um, we've got another question from Anthony. Um, thank you for your, your comment, Anthony. Um, he wants to know, why did deer preferentially eat my planted exotic species, species and CVs of ash when there were native self-sown saplings within two metres? They've clearly got it in for me personally. Yeah, that's all. Sure. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that, David, sorry. <laughs> I said, that's just sod's law. <laughs> <laughs> I, was up in, I was actually up in the Peak District of, uh, in October and we we're looking at some of the new plantings in some of the, the cleft valleys up there. And where we had natural regeneration, we found natural regeneration within the, the sward, that was actually getting away fine. But where people were putting tree guards around the, the saplings they were planting, the deer were focusing in on those trees. And I think it's because they got used to where the trees have been planted. So the deer were looking for the tree tubes to find that fresh growth out of the top of them. Okay. And they couldn't find the natural regeneration amongst the sward. So in this case, um, maybe the exotic species smelt nice. Maybe they were just more palatable. Maybe they were sweeter. OK, um, <clears throat> got a question now from Tina. Will and how will a deer carcass be tested for TB? And if detected, will it stop going into the food chain? Is there a percentage of TB found? And if there is, is it in different different in different areas? OK, well, all deer going into the food chain will be inspected by a trained hunter. Trained hunters are tested and made sure that they can assess the deer for fitness before the point of shot. And also they do a carcass examination and gland examination at after shot. Anything going through a main dealer will be assessed by a vet to make sure it's fit and healthy. TB rates are very, very low in the wild free ranging deer populations. There are a couple of hot spots, but the, the glands within uh, TB infected deer will be normally fairly raised and the, the, the trained hunters would normally be able to spot that. Um, different areas, yeah, I mean, southwest has always been a little bit prevalent around Exmoor, a uh, bit of Somerset, but predominantly the UK deer population is very, very healthy and we are TB checking and so we have any hot spot areas for bovine TB in the sort of cattle populations or badger populations, there is an extra surveillance being undertaken by AFA to make sure that it's not getting into the wider populations of animals. Brilliant. OK, uh, we've got no more questions in the chat. I can't see any raised hands. I'll just double check in the participants list, but I can't see anything. Um, so without further ado, uh, I just want a really big thank you, David, for an excellent presentation, as always. And thank you. For, thank you for stepping into cover. Um, no if, any, if anyone's got any further questions or anything, I've popped my email address in the chat and also all the deer officers emails are in the chat as well. So if anyone's not particularly from the southeast region, maybe maybe on our borders or if you are in the southeast region, you've got all our deer officer um, contact details. Um, if you're in an area that isn't currently covered by a deer officer, pick your closest one and uh, and target them and they'll be more than happy to help you as well. <laughs> so, yeah, just, just dropping a bit of extra workload onto you there, David. So uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate that. Um, but Absolutely apart from that, point. Brilliant. OK, so like I say, I'll be sending out a questionnaire to everyone to get your feedback on how you think this event and all our other, other events have gone. Um, this is being recorded and it'll be going up on YouTube, as we've mentioned. Um, so, yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, David, and hopefully we'll see you all at another event soon. So thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you all.